Okay, I think uh, in the interests of time, we should make a start. Uh, again, I'm Kevin Stratford from EPCC, and I form uh, the second part of today's double header uh, on the subject of uh, multi level contact detection in lamps. Uh, however, first, uh, we have Tom Shire of the University of Glasgow. Uh, who will give us some uh, background on this work. Uh, for the participants, uh, if you have a question as the uh, talk progresses, probably the easiest thing to do is to type it into the chat window uh, and then we can see the question and respond as appropriate. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Tom Shire. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so yeah. As uh, Kevin said, my name is Tom Shaw from the University of Glasgow. Um, and this first slide just introduces the project. It was an Archer ECSE funded project to improve uh, contact detection for polydispersed materials in, uh, in granular lamps. So the first part of the talk is talking about the motivation, so giving some context, and then how contact detection is currently done in granular lamps. Uh, I'll introduce that as kind of user of this code. I'm a geotechnical engineer. And then Kevin, who actually implemented the improved methods and he's going to present his parametric studies today. Um, he will take the second two points on this slide. He'll speak about the improved method, which we call the hierarchical stencil method. And then he'll show uh, the parametric studies to demonstrate its effectiveness. So. Um, discrete element modeling is um, a popular tool when you're looking at the micromechanics of granular materials. So things like rocks, pharmaceuticals, foodstuffs. Um, and each element within a discrete element modeling a model is uh, an individual grain. So like on the two images shown on the right, you've got bonded grains in the top image forming a sandstone. In the bottom, you've got some sort of um, discharge from a hopper. So these sorts of granular materials is, is what we're looking at. Uh, it's developed in the 70s, but it's become increasingly used um, over the past couple of decades with increasing computer power. And the advantages of DEM is that it allows microscale mechanisms within granular materials to be observed. And from that, better designs or better constitutive models to be developed. Um, a focus of some of my work is polydispersed granular materials. So this, these are granular materials in which you have a wide range of, of particle sizes. And they occur in lots of natural and industrial processes. So for example, in geotechnics, natural soils can have a huge range of particle sizes. <clears throat> or even if it starts, even if you have a fairly uniformly sized sand, for example, if you then start to install a piled foundation within it, for example, for an offshore wind turbine, in which a big piece of steel essentially gets driven into the ground. You get a lot of crushing of the sand particles and the particle size distribution changes. You also get polydispersed materials in crushing and segregation in, in materials processing and mining applications. Um, other natural processes like avalanches and landslides and also industrial processes such as uh, fluidized beds. So it's got wide applicability. Um, well, polydispersity has wide applicability across engineering and science. Um, so the effect of polydispersity, so at the bottom I show a kind of chart going from on the left, what we call a widely graded soil within the context of geotechnical engineering, through to on the right, what we call a uniformly graded soil, and you see Basically, as you go from left to right, the, the range of particle sizes reduces. Um, polydispersed materials have, have only recently started to be considered with discrete element modeling. And partly, well, the reason for this is that it's much more computationally expensive and, and time consuming. And there's two reasons for this. The first is that more particles are required. So if we have, just think about spheres, if we have a size ratio of 100 to 1, um, for each particle with a diameter of 100, 
to get the equivalent volume, we'd we would need a million particles with a um, a diameter of one. So as you get to wide range of particle sizes, to get representative samples, you start to need huge numbers of elements um, in the discrete element model. And the second reason is that the traditional contact detection methods were were uh, developed for monodisperse materials, like the one on the right of this diagram. Um, and although they work well for that, they don't tend to work well for polydispersed materials. And that was the focus of this project. So just to give you a bit more context of a typical engineering application, which which I look at, um, it will be suffusion. This is a form of erosion which occurs in what are called gap graded soils. So these are soils in which you have, like shown on the cartoon on the right, you have big particles, small particles, and a kind of miss, missing set of particles with intermediate diameters. So you've got this contrast between large and small particles. And what happens is in a gap graded soil, if, if water seeps through, if, if water flows through the soil, the fine particles can be eroded and the coarse particles can stay in place or perhaps collapse because they've lost the support that the fine particles were providing them. <coughs> and this is particular engineering hazard because um, this sort of erosion can initiate at, at low hydraulic gradients. Um, so that's the, the gradient of of hydraulic head over a certain seepage distance. So much lower than you would predict for erosion of a, of a uniformly graded soil. An example of the danger this can pose in an engineering context is this Guhu Dam in China. It was built from a, a soil that was susceptible to fusion. Um, and this is part of the reason why it collapsed when it was first, when the reservoir that this dam was retaining was first filled um, in in the 90s and the collapse of this dam 71 meter high dam um, caused a deluge downstream which caused um, 300 deaths so this is the kind of that gives the engineering context now what causes these soils to erode so easily is that the coarse particles transfer all the stress like shown in the cartoon on the right and the fine sits kind of loosely between the coarse particles under low stress. And this means that they can be easily washed out um, when water flows through. So when we you look, uh, use DEM to study this, uh, we would look at the, for example, the stress being transferred by the coarse and fine fractions, the effect of what we call the soil fabric. Particles under low stress are more likely to be eroded. And then we can use DM coupled with computational fluid dynamics to actually model the process by which um, suffusion will initiate. Now, such soils, like the ones shown on the right, are very highly polydispersed. So in a real dam, a rock fill material could easily have a ratio of the minimum, a maximum to minimum radii of, of 10,000. Um, so clearly, I mean, polydispersed controls, polydispersity controls the behavior, and it's something uh, we would like to be able to model in DM efficiently. So most DM codes, including the one in LAMPS, are uh, based on the distinct element method from Kundal and Strack, and just typically in geomechanics, or very often in geomechanics, we, we only consider coarse particles are greater than 100 microns in which the body forces dominate, and that's... Um, Although we could extend what we've we've done, the the, the lamps package we're looking at um, only looks at these coarse particles, uh, coarse in terms of body forces dominating. And lamps uh, contains a popular DM package, which I'm calling granular lamps here. And anyone who knows lamps knows it's very efficient for massively parallel simulations such as those to be carried out on Archer. Um, <clears throat> and that's why, in the context of of Archer granular lamps is an extremely good DEM package. So just take you through the, the calculations in, in a DEM time step so that where um, the work that we've carried out, you can see where the work we've carried out fits in. Um, the DEM time step starts with initial particle geometry, so that's the circles on the right. Any other geometry, for example, if you've got rigid walls, 
and a contact model, which is a kind of spring relating the amount by which particles overlap to the force acting between the particles. Um, at, the time step, at the start of the time step, you identify the particles which are in contact, and then you calculate the force um, acting between the particles using your contact model. You then calculate a resultant force for each particle, and then using Newton's second law, uh, you calculate accelerations, and then and then you integrate to get velocities, and then you integrate again to get displacements, um, and then you update the particle positions at the end of each time step. So shown here, the particles have moved, and then you move forward to the next time step, and the process starts again. And so for context, it's this first step in the DM calculation, which is one of the most time consuming, not the most time consuming, which is to identify um, the particles which are in contact. And this is the focus of our work. So in terms of contact detection, obviously the easiest way to determine which particles are in contact would be just to check every particle against every other particle in the system at each time step and see which ones are overlapping. But that would be extremely inefficient. So what codes like LAMPS use is something called enable list. And here, each particle is given a small skin surrounding it. So if the circles, black circles on the right represent DM particles, the red dot represents what in LAMPS terminology is called a skin. So just an extra distance, uh, which is not part of the particle, which might be, for example, 10% of its diameter. And then enable list is created. And the neighbor list contains every pair of particles whose skins overlap. And then at every time step, um, the pairs of particles on the neighbor list, so just those whose skins overlap, are checked to see if they're in contact. And if they are, then the force between them is calculated. And this neighbor list is only be rebuilt intermittently as, as particles move about. And how often it's rebuilt will depend on how dynamic the system is. So the particles are moving rapidly. You'll need to rebuild this neighbor list very often. Whereas if you've got static or quasi-static conditions, um, then you'll only need to rebuild the neighbor list every so often. But the neighbor list makes the whole process much more efficient. Now, in terms of building the neighbor list in the first place, again, you could check every pair of particles, but that would be very inefficient. So to build the neighbor list, another stage is added, which is called the link cell method, to avoid having to check every pair of particles every time the neighbor list is rebuilt. So here, as you see on the right, a, a grid is overlaying on the DM domain. Um, and the size of the cells in this grid um, is just slightly larger than the, the maximum particle radius, so the particle radius plus the skin distance. And then when building the neighbor list for a given particle, the neighboring cells, so those shown in light blue, are checked. And any particles that have their center within those cells are checked against the, the given particle to see if um, the, the, neighbor, the skins overlap. And then if the skins overlap, they're added to the to the neighbor list. So this is just to do with check, uh, building the neighbor list, but it makes it much more efficient. Well, it does for mono disperse DM. Um, so that the, the, the link cell method is, is very efficient for mono dispersed DM. But for poly dispersed DM, um, it makes building the neighbor list prohibitively uh, slow. And this is because, because this cell size is based on the largest particle radius. It means when you've got a big size discrepancy between particles, like shown in the top right, the link cells become filled with huge numbers of small particles. Um, and this means huge numbers of particles have to be searched through each time the neighbor list is rebuilt. Um, in LAMP, you have a similar issue with interprocessor communication. So um, in LAMPs, um, which has very efficient uh, parallel capabilities, um, the parallelization is done through spatial decomposition. So if you look on the right, the, here the cells represent 
the the subdomains which um, each processor carries out the calculations for. So, for example, the pink one in the middle would be a single a single processor would handle all the calculations within that subdomain. Um, but to do this accurately, clearly some information will need to be passed across processor um, subdomain boundaries at every time step. And um, this is done by creating what's called a halo, which is, is shown in green, um, which is based again on the maximum particle radius. And any part of a particle, if any part of a particle falls within this halo, then information about it must be passed across to the to the pink subdomain because it, that particle could potentially be in contact with a particle within the processor subdomain. And because the size of this halo is based on the, um, the largest particle, it has similar drawbacks to link cells where it could be filled with huge numbers of, of small particles. Okay, so that's that's the existing state of, of lamps before we did our work and most EM codes, in fact. Um, the project was an ECSE funded project um, and Kevin Stratford, who's about to take over, carried out the work on that. The aims of it were to extend an existing contact detection for the molecular dynamics part of LAMPS to work for the DM part. Uh, in fact, we ended up doing something different to that, but Kevin will, will speak about this. Um, demonstrate the effectiveness of the new method for large DM simulations of polydispersed particles on Archer, so show it could scale and show that it was just efficient in itself. And then the third part, which is ongoing, which is um, to release a well-documented version of the implementation into the main open source version of LAMPS. And that's, although we've got code we're happy with, um, it takes time to get it into the main version of LAMPS. So that, that's ongoing. OK, so that, that's the end of my um, introduction. So now I can hand over to Kevin. Uh, so as Tom was uh, saying, um, I'm going to give in my section uh, a few more details on the implementation of this uh, multi-level search. Uh, it occurs to me using the words uh, multi-level search is slightly unfortunate because there is already something called multi in lamps uh, so i'll try to be clear uh, as we go through uh, what the difference is between the existing multi approach if you've come across that and uh, what we've done uh, which is new so uh, i'll have a bit of a recap on how LAMPS uh, implements the bins, uh, stencils in the bin, and uh, how it does the pair search, and then discuss the new implementation and have a look at uh, some results. Okay, so this, at the um, bottom most level, if you like, um, is uh, the neighbor cell or what uh, LAMPS refers to as the neighbor bins. Uh, this idea uh, goes back, uh, way back to uh, 1959. Uh, so it's a happy 60th birthday for the neighbor bin. And uh, what you do here is to prevent uh, yourself getting into um, a search between all the particles, which is complexity n squared. Uh, if you chop up your domain into cells, uh, locate uh, particles in a given cell, uh, for a given particle, you can then uh, determine neighbors by examining only uh, nearest cells in the cell list. And that gets you from uh, complexity order n squared down to complexity order n. Uh, if you're familiar with um, the LAMPS implementation, uh, that's the uh, n bin standard, which uh, extends uh, a 
kind of abstract class in bin. If you're familiar with uh, using lamps, this is what you uh, usually request um, in the input uh, with a clause, uh, something like uh, neighbor, then this number, which is this skin distance that Tom was talking about, and bin. Uh, LAMPS does, I believe, give you the opportunity to use the N squared if you so wish, um, but I'm not aware that anybody ever does. Okay, so those are uh, the bins or the cell list. Uh, the cells, uh, in the case where you have just one size of particle are determined by the interaction uh, cutoff between small particles. Uh, if you have a situation uh, where you have different sizes of particles, so I've got a, a small particle here uh, represented as the small circle and uh, a large particle uh, which uh, has at the center denoted by a cross in this diagram, um, your uh, potential range of interaction uh, increases. So to handle uh, this case, uh, LAMPS uh, implements something which it calls a multi uh, approach, uh, which does something like the following you see in this picture. So if you are a small particle and want to find um, large particle neighbors, uh, you can extend the search in the cell list beyond uh, the nearest neighbors. So that's the sort of grayed out area. And if you've chosen your uh, stencil correctly, you're guaranteed to find all your small, large uh, neighbors in this case. Uh, so there are um, classes in uh, LAMPS which extend the base class in stencil which uh, implement various different types of stencil. So for example uh, here the stencil extends uh, uniformly around the particle in this two-dimensional picture. Um, there are other situations where you can use a sort of one-sided uh, stencil uh, to restrict uh, the element, uh, the extent of the search. Uh, this uh, multi uh, picture is introduced with this clause down at the bottom in the input. Uh, you select a neighbor instead of a bin, uh, you have a multi, and the exact stencils you get are dependent on whether you have uh, a Newton off or a Newton on. Uh, which is saying, am I going to use uh, Newton's uh, third law to um, limit uh, the number of times I have to compute the interaction? So there's various details going on there, uh, but that's the basic picture. Uh, so, okay, that we have a combination of um, uh, bins and stencils. Uh, there's one further element uh, in the picture. Uh, this is basically to form uh, a pair list. Uh, so for each particle, we maintain a list of uh, neighbors. Uh, the exact details of how that works uh, may again depend on certain choices. Uh, but the important point here is that uh, this is the list that is searched to compute uh, actual interactions. So the the, intera the pair interactions only see uh, the contents of the pair list and they don't care about cells and stencils and so forth. Uh, if you're familiar with the sort of output that comes out uh, in LAMPS, you may see something uh, like we see uh, down here at the bottom. So depending on your various uh, choices, it tells you you've got a uh, standard bin, a certain kind of stencil, uh, a certain kind of uh, pair build, so of course. 
so the, what it, you get exactly there depends what you've asked for in the input. Okay, uh, so that's the basic approach. Um, there's one problem, uh, essentially, uh, coming from uh, these stencils, uh, because the stencil uh, is basically coming from the small cell list, if you have very big particles present together with very many small particles, uh, this stencil becomes uh, or can become extremely large and then actually searching through the stencil becomes uh, a significant um, computational overhead. Uh, so what uh, you can say is this, if there is a large uh, separation of scales between uh, the small and the large particles, um, this is not um, handled uh, efficiently uh, by stencil. So the solution, or at least a solution to this uh, that we wanted to go towards uh, was basically uh, the following, and the uh, answer is reasonably simple. Uh, if in this case we just have two sizes of particle, uh, we're going to bin each size of particle in its own cell list. So we're going to have a small cell list and a large cell list. The small cell list is represented on the left and the large one on the right. Uh, so you bin small particles in the small cells and the large particles in uh, the large cells. So to do this, we have implemented a new uh, bin type, uh, which ex again extends this base class n bin, and you select that in the input. Uh, so instead of standard bin, which is would be neighbor skin distance bin, we have this clause neighbor skin distance by type. So how does LAMPS know uh, what's a small particle and what's a big particle? Uh, well, this is set uh, by the user. Essentially, um, there is each particle in LAMPS has a type attribute, uh, which in this case, you would have to give one value to the small particles and another value to the large particles. So again, we follow the same kind of picture uh, to implement uh, stencils in. Uh, now we have basically two uh, cell lists or bins, uh, large and small. And so we have a sort of hierarchical picture uh, where small, small neighbors, that is small neighbors of small particles can be located by searching in the small cell list. And the important thing here is that that search in the small cell list for small, small neighbors can be carried out with a compact stencil. So you don't have to have this enormous uh, stencil. Likewise, large, large neighbors can be located in the large cell list, again, using a compact stencil. Uh, you have to do uh, a little bit of uh, work to identify um, large, small, or small, large interactions uh, in this picture by having a slightly different process uh, and potentially a different stencil. Uh, so for example, if you wanted to uh, locate this small large interaction, what you can do is locate the small particle in the large cell list and then use the compact stencil in the large cell list to identify large neighbors. And that um, sort of hierarchical picture uh, turns out to be uh, quite an efficient way of uh, going forward. 
Okay, um, there's one uh, further efficiency uh, consideration we have addressed in this work um, uh, compared with the standard lamps multi approach. Uh, so here in the picture, there's a rather simple representation of um, a subdomain in the domain decomposition message passing picture. So for particles at the edge of a given subdomain uh, to locate uh, potential interactions with particles owned by a neighboring subdomain, you have to uh, communicate uh, the neighboring particles, these so-called ghost or halo particles, and do the search. Uh, in the existing multi approach, it turns out that um, to compute uh, small, small, uh, you need uh, quite a large um, halo width. Uh, with the hierarchical approach, what it turns out you can actually get rid of uh, the requirement to have such a large uh, halo region. And if you have very many small particles, this um, uh, efficiency saving uh, can be used um, to uh, significantly reduce the number of particles you have to uh, communicate. Okay, uh, so that's a slightly sketchy um, uh, description of the implementation. Uh, move on uh, now to some results. So uh, the first result is actually for a, uh, all my pictures have been uh, the two size case, uh, but the approach uh, generalizes. Uh, quite well to the polydisperse uh, case. So uh, I've got some tests here, which are uh, a model system, which is based on sand, uh, which is uh, with a particle size distribution, which is shown, shown here on the right. So this is a real uh, case um, where we have uh, a sand with lots of particles of diameter about one to two microns and then there's a bit of a gap in the distribution and there's uh, another peak in the distribution at about 200 to 300 microns and you, you notice in, in this real case um, the largest particle gets out to something like uh, a thousand uh, microns so the actual range of sizes from the smallest to the largest is about three orders of magnitude uh, which is actually quite uh, a challenging problem. Uh, so what we did for these tests is to actually rescale the distribution uh, so that uh, the, actually what we did, the ratio of the peaks uh, is uh, set to a given uh, size. So we've done, I think we've got uh, 10 to one, uh, 20 to one uh, and so on. So the interesting thing about this multi-level approach is that uh, we can use uh, two types. Uh, so uh, the question then arises, given this continuous distribution, how do I split these particles up into two types, which I'm going to call large and small? Where do I make the split? Uh, so uh, looking at the distribution, you might say, well, somewhere in the trough of the distribution uh, between the two peaks. Uh, so the results here, uh, we're going to have a look at, uh, show uh, some different cases. So what is plotted here, we've got three panels on the left, uh, is this uh, D, it's actually D max over D min is uh, 
10 rather than R. Again, D max over D min is 20 in the middle and D max over D min is 40 on the right. Uh, so what is on the horizontal axis is the diameter of where I have drawn uh, the separation between the two types. So that's where I've put the line in the distribution, if you like. So what's actually measured here, this is the time for the uh, neighbor list uh, construction. Uh, so what we've got here is a comparison of the existing uh, multi method, which are uh, the upper set of points and um, the new uh, hierarchical by type method uh, is the lower set of points. So you can see there uh, that we're doing perhaps uh, notice the vertical scale is a, a log scale here. Uh, so we're doing perhaps uh, two to three times better in the uh, neighbor list construction uh, compared with the existing uh, multi approach. Uh, furthermore, what's encouraging about this, it's not too sensitive as uh, to where you put your uh, cut uh, to make the criteria between um, small and large particles. So we are not the first uh, people to play this game of using uh, hierarchical methods, but some of the hierarchical methods um, are quite complex in that you have to decide how many levels in the hierarchy and where you draw um, uh, the uh, dividing line between those levels. Um, the method we have here, which combines just a two level hierarchy plus this stencil approach uh, seems to be reasonably uh, robust in, in terms of how you uh, set that up as the user. So that's polydispersed case. Uh, as a, the, if you like, um, a limiting uh, case, if you like, um, uh, is uh, a bidisperse system where we have exactly uh, two sizes uh, rather than a distribution. Uh, so again, we have a model system here where we have um, set uh, a fixed uh, solid volume fraction of large particles and a fixed solid volume fraction of small particles. And we've uh, changed um, the value of R, so R here is um, the ratio of the largest to the smallest. So we've gone uh, R equals 10, R equals 20, up to R equals 100. Uh, so that's quite a um, significant uh, separation in scales between the two particle sizes. So again, what is uh, plotted on the horizontal axis in each case here is actually uh, the, bait, the, the bin size in the small bin here and the uh, time on the vertical axis is the time for the uh, neighbor list rebuild. Uh, so these plots are a little bit busy, uh, but you can see um, if we just look at R equals 10, uh, the top two sets are the existing multi uh, approach and the bottom three sets of points are the new uh, by type approach uh, for various uh, different options. Uh, so you can see at R equals 10, we're doing a little bit better uh, than the existing multi approach. Uh, and we can do this um, at more or less the same uh, base bin size. Uh, what is um, 
evidence, if you look at the vertical scale for these plots, um, is that as uh, the ratio of the small to the large size becomes larger and you go towards 100, uh, the existing uh, multi approach uh, really does become, starts to become extremely painful. Uh, and this is basically this problem that uh, you, the large separation in scales between small and large is giving you an extremely large stencil, which becomes um, very difficult uh, computationally. So um, those are, um, uh, we, uh, if you are interested in, um, particularly if you are doing by disperse um, systems, uh, this can be absolutely critical. Uh, just uh, finally, a result on uh, some scaling. So this is uh, the R equals 10, R equals 20, and R equals 40 um, result for the same results as we saw in the previous slide. Uh, this is uh, speed up compared with uh, one Archer node, that is 24 uh, MPI tasks. And uh, what we see is um, the circles here are the new uh, by type approach with the um, reduced communication and the squares are the existing multi approach. So this um, uh, reduction in the number of small particles that you have to communicate uh, really does uh, have uh, an improving effect on uh, communication to computation ratio uh, as you increase uh, the difference in the size of the particles. Okay, so hopefully that's just given you some uh, brief overview of the work uh, we've done here. Uh, so we've extended uh, the uh, existing multi approach uh, to a, a multi level or a hierarchical uh, picture. Uh, and we're hoping this will be uh, effective um, for poly dispersed systems and it's actually uh, turns out to be extremely good for bi dispersed uh, systems as well. Uh, there's a couple of um, questions that have occurred to me uh, in writing this um, presentation. Uh, one could wonder uh, the reduced uh, communication uh, option I alluded to um, could be more robust in the sense that um, the user can request it uh, but the user has got to be careful that uh, it's appropriate uh, because if you select it in the wrong circumstances, uh, you're, going, you're going to lose uh, interactions. Uh, the other thing that's occurred to me um, at the moment, uh, we uh, this hierarchical picture is uh, based on the type system. Uh, one can imagine uh, situations where you might like to decouple the two. So, for example, if you had two different types of uh, small particle having small uh, different interactions, say, um, they would necessitate uh, having a separate uh, bin structure for each type, whereas uh, you might only require really require one. So there's a potential um, inefficiency there uh, for some. Uh, types of system, which could potentially be addressed. Uh, we should, um, at this point, uh, as we come to a close, uh, make an acknowledgement of Ishan Srivastava of Sandia, who uh, made available to us for this work uh, a few classes for LAMPs, which are not um, in uh, the public release uh, at the moment and also to um, 
the other folks at LAMPS for some uh, useful uh, observations. Uh, so that's uh, the end of the presentation. Uh, there's a chance uh, for some questions if anybody uh, has some questions uh, and either I or Tom will do our best to answer them. Uh, if there are no questions, uh, thank you very much for attending and the next webinar will uh, be announced through the usual channels I expect. Thank you very much.